so uh, we're going to continue on the chair. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, of course, uh, since this is a new day, uh, we can go File, right? And we go to Set Project, right? File, Set Project. <clears throat> and then, of course, I can find Project 4 because that's what we're working on now. Remember, you don't open the folder. You just hit Set. And there we go. And then, of course, we can go File, Open Scene, and it takes us right to Project 4 Scenes where the chair is at, right? Uh, and remember, it also will uh, know where to find any reference images or any textures. That's what's cool about projects is, um, like I said before, if you're on um, your own computer all the time, it's not so much of an issue, but like if you're moving folders around different computers, um, projects can be quite a useful way to organize stuff and to make sure that um, you don't have to keep re reloading stuff in like textures and images, right? Um, so that's kind of the cool thing about projects is it's a good, good way to organize stuff and to make sure that <clears throat> Um, the project itself, the scene you're working in, knows where to find any uh, external things that are loaded into it. Usually images, right? From reference images from our image planes or from texturing, which we'll be seeing on our next project, Project 5. Um, so I'm going to open and don't save, of course, because um, it's just asking to save this um, empty scene, right? And there's our chair, and that's where we kind of left off from the other day. Um, now at this point, you know, like little things like this, we're not worrying too much about shaping. Um, although if you did want to at least kind of get a little bit of that curvature in there, um, that would be one of those things where, you know, you could turn symmetry on, right, of course. In this case, we're using world Z. And I could easily just kind of come back in here and um, hold down my mouse button, right, of the object, vertex. And we can always just grab a vertex and kind of just bring it down and forward a little bit, right? And, if we needed one more edge loop in there, we could always do multi-cut, kind of put a little extra edge loop in there. Um, and of course, you know, Q for your regular selection tool, then move, and you can just kind of, and you see how you can kind of start to get that shape in there where it kind of uh, pinches in. Um, in this case, we're worried more about the general shape, kind of uh, there's not much detail here. Um, also, uh, it's one of those things where I make a chair a lot like this one, right? Um, just because if you try to do like a really crazy one of those super super uh, detailed race car chairs that have all those little different cushions and panels, it's going to be a bit tricky, right? Um, so keep it kind of simpler, uh, uh, more like this where you're not getting it into too crazy of shapes, right? <clears throat> Alright, um, so just kind of, you know, just FYI if you ever need to do a little bit of shaping, you can do that stuff. I'll save that. Um, and what we really wanted to do today is we wanted to make kind of the attachment connecting part here and the kind of spoke structure here. Um, the wheels we'll do next week. Um, this guy and this guy, uh, I'm actually probably not going to show you guys how to do because you know how to do them, right? Or like I'll, I'll do them super quick or something because they're that's a cylinder, right? And that's a little kind of bar with a, a, a shape on the end. Um, that's the kind of stuff that knowing everything you know, you could actually do those. Um, this is kind of the stuff where uh, it's, I want to kind of point out some stuff on this. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's what we want to do. I'm going to go to um, hold down right mouse button, object mode, right? So we're back to object level. You can just click off anywhere, right? And we want to make this, right? Now, if we look at this, this is predominantly kind of a cylindrical shape right here, right? And it kind of uh, flows into some uh, uh, seamless plastic parts here, right? There's kind of separations here, here, and here. Um, those are pretty easy to do after the fact, right? <clears throat> um, but in particular, these are all cylinders down into here and even blends into that. And these are kind of all one seamless piece. Um, and ideally, that's what I'm looking for from you guys as well, right? Because that makes this modeling process easier and explore what we want to do. <clears throat> so a cylinder is going to be a great way to start this off, much like we did with the switch on our lamp, right? This is actually basically the switch from our lamp, but we're going to do it a little more intricate. Um, talk about how to reorient our manipulators a little bit more um, and do a little bit more to it. But it's kind of that, but like kind of on the side here, right? Um, so one of the things we really have to think about, and we didn't really think about it on the switch because it didn't really matter that much, right? Um, one, uh, usually when you're making kind of stuff like this, it's kind of kind of a radial symmetry, right? Um, where it's kind of these things radial out like in a circular kind of shape, cylindrical kind of shape, but are still kind of have a symmetry, right? Um, Building as a primitive with even numbers is really, really important. We kind of already saw that with our switch, right? If we didn't do it with even numbers, there'd be a too big a gap or no gap uh, when we get to kind of back to the start, right, of the shape. Uh, and even kind of on our, our um, the little booleans that we did kind of for like the arches for our room, right? We kind of made sure to work with even numbers. Uh, even numbers tend to be better to work with um, for this kind of stuff. That doesn't mean sometimes the odd number won't work, but uh, in general, um, 
more, a lot more often than not, even numbers are going to be better. Now, in this case, one of the things we have to think about is um, the spoke structure here, right? The cylinder is going to be pretty easy to make. We're just going to create a cylinder. But we have to think about how many polygons we are going to extrude off for the spokes, right? These guys right here. And if we count, we see one, two, three, four, five, right? Five spokes. So at a minimum, we need five polygons kind of going around the uh, diameter, right? The circumference of this cylinder. Um, but if you'll notice, there is kind of not just a spoke, but there's a little bit of a gap in between each spoke, right? There's a little bit of a gap. So one of the things we need to be able to do with that gap is um, in incorporate that as well. Um, so if we have five spokes, we have five gaps, right? So that actually right there gives us the number of um, divisions we want kind of around the axis of the cylinder, 10, right? Because we have a spoke and we have a gap. And you might be thinking, well, what if I don't have any gaps? Okay, well, it's possible that they just go right into each other and then you just pick the number of spokes, right? But oftentimes there will be gaps. So you might be asking yourself, well, what if I've got more gaps than spokes? Well, that's actually physically impossible. Right, you actually are always going to have the same number of spokes as gaps, right? Uh, unless one of those areas is not radially symmetrical and it is small or different shaped than other stuff, then maybe you wouldn't have a gap. But um, in terms of if this is going to be radially symmetrical, uh, symmetrical, um, you're always going to have the same number of gaps as spokes. Um, so that's where we get ten, right? Five spokes plus five gaps is ten. Now, if you wanted your spokes to be larger, right, more polygons. In this case, we're not. We're not going to worry about that. But if you wanted your uh, um, these to be uh, like say two polygons for each spoke and then one polygon for each gap, well then you would need two polygons per spoke, and that's two times five, ten, plus the gaps. And if those are only one polygon, then those are five, right? Five plus ten, fifteen. So just factor that in. If you have six spokes, right? Then if you're going uh, with one one, it's twelve. If you're going with two one, it's going to be 18, right? Because six times two, if you want two polygon spoke gaps, right? Or two polygon spokes, that's six times two, 12, plus the six gaps, right? Six plus 12, 18. So just keep that in mind, the kind of those simple numbers. Uh, it's really basic arithmetic, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, it's much like kind of the divisions we did for um, copying our, our um, spokes and things like that, right? Um, even our buttons on our clock radio. Um, you know, 360 divided by how many numbers you want, and that gives you your degrees, right? If it's 360 divided by 8, it's 45, right? 45 degrees for rotations. And we're going to see that again for the wheels here. We're going to see it for our ceiling fan, um, um, fan blades as well. So we got some kind of cut more times of looking at duplicate special. But um, sometimes it's just a little bit of basic arithmetic, right? And believe it or not, much like I kind of showed you guys the clock radio uh, as kind of a secret way to build a car, Right? You can actually use extruded bridge border edges to build cars and spaceships and all that stuff. Um, believe it or not, kind of some of that simple math for how you're going to build the spokes and how many spokes you want would actually be useful for making a car rim. Right? Obviously, we're not going to make a full car rim here. And, um, but some of that information of kind of like, hey, think about how many spokes you want, how many each polygon spoke is going to be, uh, how, many, how much of a gap. And that will give you a good indicator of um, how many divisions to have for your rim. So that's actually still kind of a cool trick even for car rims. All right, so uh, we decided 10 because uh, um, one polygon for each spoke, 5, plus one polygon for each gap, 10. So what we do is we go, I'll turn symmetry off, right? When you're working with uh, cylindrical stuff, um, particularly if you want to keep it symmetrical, symmetry is going to screw you up, right? Symmetry is awesome for a lot of stuff, but for cylindrical sh uh, shapes like this, right? Cylindrical shapes like this, symmetry is actually um, not that useful. It actually can do weird stuff. It's not supporting radial symmetry anyways and it can actually make your shapes become oval and squashed. So believe it or not, symmetry is not a good idea to have on. It should be off, right? Just click on that triangle off when you're working with kind of like stuff like this, right? So now I'm going to go to create. And that's just a little bit of concept work, getting it out of the way, right? Um, just talking about some basic ideas um, that aren't the tools. Uh, so we go pre create polygon primitive cylinder, right? And we go to the options box, right? And that'll bring the options box up here. And you'll notice I've kind of already have it set up, um, but we want it on the Y axis because that's this axis, right? That goes up and down. So Y axis, boom, goes up and down, right? Now, um, you'll notice my axis divisions. That's how many um, faces it's going to have kind of around the circumference, right? That's how many sides the cylinder is going to have, right? Height divisions would be how many edge loops it has going this way, right? Going up it. 
Um, the axis divisions is how many it go, uh, how many uh, edge loops or faces it has going around the cylinder shape. So when we were talking about that number 10, it should go on axis divisions, 10, right? But that's where it would go, right? If you wanted to do six spokes, it would be 12, right? Um, if you wanted the, uh, the spokes to have more polygons than the gaps, you know, that might be 18, right? Because of six times two for the spokes and then six uh, times one for the gap and then six plus 12. So uh, axis division is 10 on the y-axis and we can create it. Now it's a little large. So of course, uh, remember alt left, rotate your camera. Alt middle moves your camera. Alt right should zoom your camera. That's the stuff you should hopefully be pretty good with by now, right? Uh, I mentioned it, to most videos I mention it, right? At the beginning, just to kind of remind you guys. And you guys have spent enough time with it. And it was on our quick keys quiz and all that stuff. Just like Q is your selection, W is your move tool, E is rotate, R is scale, right? So R for scale. And then I just put Alt, alt right mouse button, just kind of zoom out a little bit. And I want to make this smaller, but I want to make it smaller on all the axes. Remember, that's that center one, right? It's it's usually light blue, but if it's the last thing you're using, it's going to be yellow because it's letting you know it's actually selected, right? You know, so it kind of highlights yellow. So if I left click drag on that, that'll scale the whole thing down. Now remember F, F for uh, frame selection, right? F for frame. Remember, that's going to zoom in on your object. Now, we really want to keep this cylinder on the zero. Right? So I'm going to hit W for move, and I'm going to grab the green arrow and move it down. And it needs to be a bit taller, so I'll hit R for scale. Actually, I think it should be a little thinner too. So R for scale, left click drag to make that a little smaller, and then left click drag to grab this one to make it taller just on the Y axis, whereas remember that's doing all three. Remember these squares will do two at a time. Um, it should definitely be lower down, so I'll hit W for move again, kind of get it down there. And we're not trying to get the whole thing yet, right? We're going to build that other stuff um, in our second video uh, for today. Um, we're really just trying to kind of get this main kind of um, thing in place there, right about there. Now, in this case, you notice how maybe uh, my chair should be a little fur forward, right? Well, I'm going to left click on this, shift left click, remember shift adds, and then shift left click, and I'm going to move those forward. Leave the cylinder where it's at, guys. Don't go, oh, well, my chair's already here, I'm going to move that back. Yeah, at the end of the day, that's not the end of the world, but that's particularly this one we want on the zero of the world. Otherwise, it would be like the um, buttons we did for a clock radio, right? Where um, we would need to use snapped vertex to kind of align up um, for duplicating the wheels around. So it's just a lot easier to have keep the cylinder on the zero of the world, right? The axis it was created on for the X and for the Z, right? For the red and the blue. Why it's okay to move up and down but we do want to keep it on the zero for that. It's always a good idea to work uh, somewhat on the zero for your models, right? Remember, you can always create multiple scenes as we were doing, right? We can import them all in or, or create references, right? Remember, our, our reference exercise was not the images. It wasn't our reference pictures. There is an actual referencing function that's not the pictures, right? Those, that's image plane stuff. Um, those are just picture references. There's actually a different kind of uh, setup for actual references that are models that are brought in and it does something different. Remember, there is that exercise two video. Okay, uh, so that gets us kind of right in a position there and kind of made that little adjustment to those guys. Um, I'm gonna make it R for scale again, make it a little taller because we do want kind of the spokes coming out of there as well. Should be good, maybe W from down a little bit. All right, so now we've got the cylinder started. Now, in this case, there's a good amount of roundness on this, right? And there's a good amount of roundness on the top of the spokes. So Whereas a lot of the early part of the semester, we were working straight low res um, and using bevels, and that's great. We wanted to make sure you guys know that you can use that, particularly if you're doing architectural stuff, if you're doing desks and things like that. Low res with bevels is gonna be great, right? And it's great to be doing that and building that. But as we've seen, once you start to get to more curved, organic, softer stuff, um, even though technically you can make it all low res and do all the shaping by hand, um, it can actually be a bit faster and easier to use smooth preview and then eventually smooth your models, right? Um, before, by the time I'm done, I'm going to smooth these, right? Um, so uh, keep that in mind, right? We're going to use that as a shortcut, uh, make our lives a little bit easier. So remember, three is smooth preview, right? So three on your keyboard is smooth preview. One is low res, right? So see how kind of one toggles it off, three turns it on, right? And that's the one and three that are above Q and W and E, right? So it's kind of the ones on the left-hand side of your keyboard next by escape. 
um, by your letters, you know, by QWERTY, Q-W-E-R. So we're talking about those uh, quick keys, right? Three for smooth preview, one for low res. So remember, your smooth preview is something you can turn off, right? You can toggle it off and on. Um, all right, so we toggle it on, and you'll notice this makes it a little bit like a pill shape. And we don't really want that. And we've already talked about this a bit. We talked about it on our cushions. We talked about it a bit on our brace um, and things like that, even our clock radio. Uh, but I want to really highlight it specifically again right here. Remember, what happens is at the top here of this, it's too soft, right? Because smooth preview by its very nature is supposed to round the shape off, right? It's actually giving you extra polygons here virtually, right? Um, if I just go to attribute editor, you guys don't have to do this, but I'm going to show it to you again, right? Smooth mesh. Um, you could tell it to display subdivisions, and then what it's doing is it's showing you all the polygons it's virtually adding. But you'll notice that you're still working with kind of the low res shape, right? You're still working with the low res polygon, even though um, it's kind of virtually giving you more polygons. That's really what a uh, subdivisional surface is doing. Remember, if you ever accidentally hit Alt 3, right? What that does is it turns on displacement preview, and you can't, even by hitting 3, get rid of the control cage, right? So what you do is you just turn displacement preview off and turn on use subdivisional surfaces again. Uh, and then you're usually fine. Uh, and then you'll see it's uh, back to normal. Uh, so normally you don't have to go in here and do this, but there are some options for your smooth preview right in the smooth mesh area in the attribute editor. That was a side note. Um, you guys don't have to do that unless you need to fix something, but it, I want to remind you guys that's what is happening with the subdivisional surface. It's, it's virtually creating new polygons and it's rounding the corners off, right? It's kind of averaging the positions of the new vertices creating particulate corners, and that creates that more rounded organic shape. Um, these are also known as subdivisional surfaces. You notice we call it smooth preview, because mine calls it smooth preview, but if you go back into there, right, and you go to smooth mesh, open subdiv by Kevin Clark, that's actually a subdivisional surface type that Pixar uses. Uh, and it's actually the standard. Pixar subdivisional services are the standard in the industry. Pretty much everybody's using them for their sub Ds um, or smooth previews. Kind of synonyms there, right? Sub, sub Ds, subdivisional surfaces, and smooth preview are, are basically the same thing. Um, but we get to that point where this is too round, right? We want rounding this way, and even at the tops, we want about, about a round a corner, but it's still a too soft. So remember, you really see the rounding at the corners, right? Where there's a not flat surfaces, right? So in this case, what we have to do is we have to make those corners smaller because then the rounding that it does is still there, right? It's still doing that rounding, but the rounding is smaller because the shape there is smaller. The corner is smaller. So what we do is we go to multi-cut, right? And we hold down control because that lets us put an edge loop in. And I can put an edge loop up towards the top. And you saw that automatically starting to get a bit sharper. And I'm gonna hold down control so I can put another one in there, but not right on top, right? It should be a little bit of space between that and the low res. And there we go. So if I hit one, you see how there's still a bit of a gap between them? That's important, right? You do not want edge loops and edges right on top of other edge loops and edges. They can do weird stuff sometimes. So remember that. Um, that's why when we extrude stuff, we always move or scale a little bit because that would create the same scenario where those edge loops are right on top of each other. So I'm going to hold down Control so I can put an edge loop down here and then one more and probably just one more in the middle. And that will give us a pretty good distribution of edge loops for uh, keeping shape. Right, And now you'll see how these are much nicer looking. This is looking like a much nicer, kind of harder, but not super hard cylinder. So you notice just by adding edge loops in with multi-cut, right, it adds those in. Now if I hold down my right mouse button of the object, right, because remember, put your cursor over your object, hold down right mouse button, you can go, you can move your cursor to your selection types, and go to edge mode. And if I double left click on this edge, right, remember, it selects the whole edge loop. And if I hit W, I can move this up, and you see how it becomes harder still? And if I move it down, it becomes softer. So you see that what's really happening is by adding these extra edge loops in, um, what we're getting is we're getting some better shape, right? We're getting uh, the shape smaller, right? That corner becomes smaller, and so the actual rounding becomes smaller, and it looks more like a, a, a bevel, right? So this is one of the neat things about working with Smooth Preview is that when you really understand that, you can actually get some really awesome hard surface stuff with Smooth Preview, right? Uh, maybe not a desk, right? Because just boxes and bevels works great, but like a car or spaceship that's got lots of curved organic forms, but also has some kind of sharper bevels and areas like that. So really kind of good to know how to really use your Smooth Preview uh, to get a lot of the shapes you want. 
Um, I'm going to double click on this one because these spokes are a little higher. So I'm going to double left click on that one, move this up. There we go. That should be good. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the actual spokes now. So uh, we go hold down right mouse button to face, right? Or face selection type. There we go. And I'm going to select this face. And I'm going to hold down shift because remember, shift adds, right? It actually technically subtracts also, but control also subtracts as well. So remember, hold down shift, left click again, left shift left click again. And you notice I'm skipping each one. Shift left, shift left click, shift left click. And you notice because we did 10 axis divisions for our cylinder when we created it, right? Remember when we created our polygon per minute, we went to the options box and we tried to 10 axis divisions. Like I said, if you have more spokes than five, then take that into consideration. That'll be whatever number that is by two. Um, usually most chairs will have five spokes though. Um, but if yours has four, four times two, eight, right? If yours has six spokes, six times two, 12. Um, if you wanted each polygon to have uh, each spoke to have more polygons in the gaps, how many polygons you want for the spoke would be factored into that as well. Uh, but in this case, 10 should probably be good for a lot of your guys' chairs, particularly if you have five spokes and the gaps and the spokes are relatively the same size. All right, so uh, we're just grabbing every other polygon. So there we go. And now what we want to do is we need to pull those spokes out, right? Now, remember, we did this on our uh, knob switch for our lamp, right? Um, any structure that looks like an appendage, which these are kind of look like they're growing out like arms or tentacles, right? Um, hint, octopus, right? You can make an octopus in a very similar fashion if you needed to. Um, basically any appendage structure, which is a lot of stuff, believe it or not, um, extrusion is going to make that for you. It's built to do that. That is the purpose of the extrude tool is to make appendage structures. So I'm going to hit extrude. Now, in this case, I've extruded and I don't do what I'm about to do, but if I switch to my regular move tool, which normally we like to do because it'll allow us to move exactly where we want to move it at, but in this case, you notice how that actually kind of really sucks, right? Because we're just moving along this axis. And honestly, 70, 75% of the time, that's what you want to do. You want to extrude, you just want to move it straight out in an axis, um, particularly if you have multiple polygons selected. In this case though, that's not what we wanted, right? So I, I just undid a couple times, Control Z. Remember, Control-Z for undo. So this time I'm going to extrude, but I'm going to use that normal direction, right? And we've talked about this on a couple of occasions already, particularly when we thicken objects. We like using that blue arrow, right? That blue arrow is our local translate Z. That's basically going to move along normal direction. And remember, normal direction is really just the direction the polygon is facing, right? The direction it's facing, it's pointing. So if I grab that blue arrow, left click, drag on that blue arrow, I'm only going to move it out a little bit because we want to have an edge loop pretty close to the base to get some sharpness there. So we want to move that a little bit, but not too much. I'm going to extrude a second time, right? Now you'll notice that my spokes actually kind of uh, taper a little bit as they come down, um, but I'm only on the top. So I'm going to um, just kind of move that out some more. But you see how these faces are moving along their normal direction? So remember, extrude along normal direction sometimes is amazing. When you're doing stuff like this, it's great. When you're doing a thicken, it's great. If you're making arms, legs, fingers, and toes for a character creature, not so good, right? Um, you even saw a little bit how you could use that edit mesh transform, um, or I think it's a control middle mouse button. Uh, I always forget it. Um, for just move along normal. Um, so yeah, um, I'm gonna move this out a little bit more though because um, this one's kind of pretty straight, right? So I'm gonna move it out here a little bit. Um, but if you had like a little more of a bend in this, like yours curved down more, uh, you could easily extrude again. Um, so that way there's kind of an edge loop in the center here, move this out and then hit W for move, right? And just move it straight down. And you see that just those face on the end, since we have this edge loop here, uh, it keeps some of that shape, right? But allows us to bend that form, right? Um, now in this case, you know, I don't really need that for mine. So I'll just kind of undo it but that's about the length of the spokes. But mine does taper a little bit, right? So I can go to edge mode if I wanted to, right? And I can just kind of select all these edges on the ends here. There we go. And we could always just kind of um, move those down a bit, right? And so it starts to get us that taper. It starts to get us a little bit of that taper of the shape. Um, I might even kind of grab these ones and move these down as well. But you notice I'm grabbing all five. 
And you might be asking yourself, does symmetry work for that? No, <laughs> right? It, it just won't. Um, so this is where you just have to do some manual selecting. But you said we can kind of get a little bit of that taper just by moving these edges down a little bit to kind of create that shape. Now, before I kind of harden this up a little bit more, I do want to point out something that you guys might find useful. I'm not going to need it so much on this chair picture, but it can be very, very cool. And this is kind of what we're going to finish the video up with, um, and then we'll kind of make the, um, the cylinder structure and kind of the connecting brace on here for the next video. And that is the fact that we have the ability to reorient our manipulators. We've seen it a little bit already, uh, and we haven't needed it that much yet. Uh, here we might actually need it. You guys might not need to, but I want to make sure you guys know about it. So in this case, I'm going to go to face mode again, right? Hold down right, hold down right mouse button on my object, face. And in this case, it still remembers the face selection from before, so that's fine, but you can always reselect those. Now, I've got my move tool on, and if we're just going to move up or down along the green arrow, the Y axis, that's fine. But the moment we try to move along the blue or the Z, not so good. Same thing with the red, right? There's no real local control. Now, like I said before, if we held down control middle mouse button kind of on the um, one of the handles here, you notice how that kind of moves along normal direction, right? So just like transform can move along normal direction at a mesh transform, uh, control middle mouse button on any manipulator handle will move along normal direction. But that's not really what we want here, right? What if I wanted maybe spiral these a little bit? That's not really gonna work for us. What if maybe I wanted to rotate these to point down a little bit? That's not really gonna work for us. This is where going down to the uh, modeling toolkit, right? It is available if you just double click on the move tool itself, or even remember, if you hold down W and left click, you notice how you get these objects options here, right? So you can uh, pick world, object, component, snap, um, you can go to axis here to kind of pick normal parent, uh, custom if you wanted to. Um, so you know you have some options there if you want them uh, available. Component, right? So remember, if you hold down W, left mouse button, you do have a marking menu for your uh, move tool options. But sometimes that can be hard to remember, whereas you know where to find it in the interface. Modeling toolkit, at the very bottom, right, is our move settings. We can type in numbers. We can hit edit pivot, right? We've seen that before where we can kind of move that around. But you'll also notice there is the ability to click on this little triangle next to world. And world's a good default to have on, right? Usually it's better to have world on a lot of the time and have it on as your default. But you'll notice right below there is something called component, right? Component. Custom is usually when we hit edit pivot, we move it somewhere else. But there's something called component, right? And I talked about this briefly when we were using the transform tool, right? And I kind of remember it was like, oh yeah, I really need separate polygons. Ones that are all continuous, it's better to just move along normal direction or um, you know transform. But in this case, um, you'll notice that if I was to say grab the blue arrow, it does like just like the Y. But you'll notice that the red arrow moves along normal direction, and the green arrow kind of can move locally. So component really is kind of doing a local, if you will, right? So. Believe it or not, component is working as each component, each face is independent of the rest. So component can be really, really cool for doing things like this if you needed to, right? Or if you really wanted to just move along normal direction again, right? So component, particularly when they're independent of each other, right? When they're not touching. So you see how they're kind of separated and not next to each other? Component can be great. It's kind of like basically like a local, right? So instead of setting it to the world or the global, it's setting it to the local, kind of the actual specific faces independent of each other. And that's kind of neat, right? Because if I was to turn my scale tool on with object or world being on, you'll notice how it kind of just scales them all out along the center. But you'll notice that I can switch to component for the scale tool also. And then you notice how each scale is local, right? And so that could be a cool way to kind of make them thicker independent of each other. So even though we don't have radial symmetry, component does give us a lot of that functionality back, right? So you'll notice we can get some kind of cool functionality there uh, just by using component instead of world. And of course that even works for rotate, right? With rotate on uh, set to world, right? It's going to do this, right? Which is not really what we wanted. But if we set that to component, you'll notice that each one is independent of each other now. See how we can kind of rotate them down? 
right? If we wanted to kind of twist it, we could rotate them to the red and even a twist this way. So you see how component can be really, really neat um, for areas like this, right? Now you guys might not need it because you might have one a lot like this and it's just kind of overkill. But I wanted to make sure you guys had a video showing you this option, right? That component basically kind of gives you a local um, manipulator where each kind of face or edge that are independent of each other can do this. Now you could do even a little bit more than that, right? So if I went in here and I went to kind of edge mode and I selected edge loops, you'll notice that for like this, it'll work pretty well. But the moment we want to do this, it's going to do some weird stuff, right? Because you notice how the red axis will line up well, but the green and the blue are not, right? It's kind of trying to average the component, right? When things are actually part of the same edge loop, right, next to each other, it can often get confused many of the axes. So if you wanted to actually use component on these edge loops, it's not quite so simple, right? Um, it's much better to kind of select, say, the bottom and the tops, right, or the sides. Because then you'll see when I turn it on, because they're independent of each other, this will actually work a lot more uh, the way you're expecting it to, right? So believe it or not, it's kind of better to um, select kind of the edge uh, not the whole edge loop in instances like that. Um, components, not magic, right? It's very useful, it's cool to know about, but it's not perfect, right? Um, but scale, and you see how that would work pretty well to kind of allow you to thicken those out, right? Whereas if we try to do it with the whole edge loops, it's just not gonna work well, right? So when you're kind of working on these guys, don't select the whole edge loop. The moment you um, have several edges or faces that are all touching each other, like a whole edge loop, it's gonna confuse many of the axes um, for component, right? So like I said, it's better to kind of do every other one, right? Or kind of like the tops and the bottoms. Like, see if I did the sides here, uh, same thing, right? Turn scale tool on, and you see how it does a much better job of kind of uh, centering itself out for those, right? So. Uh, keep that in mind is you're really going to want to maybe not use whole edge loops if you wanted to um, adjust kind of these areas size wise kind of just grab two at a time all right uh, so good to know about those little things um, one of the last things that you might find useful or neat if you did want to work with whole edge loop right instead of using component what you can do is you can use edit pivot right so if i hit edit pivot you'll notice that I can actually, of course, move this anywhere I want to. We can click off to reset. Um, and you can hold down control, click to kind of re, uh, reorient it if you need to. It's kind of trying to use that custom initially though. Um, but you'll notice that um, with edit pivot on, the moment I start to move my cursor over polygons or edges or vertices, it gives me an align function. So I can click on that edge and then maybe click back on this one to align it. And you notice how that's actually now aligned perfectly with that top edge there? So you can actually take advantage of this if you needed to, right? You can always just have um, edit pivot on and then turn it off. And it'll work for move, rotate, or scale, right? In fact, you'll see that move, rotate, and scale are all set to custom. And now you'll notice that if I needed to, I could scale out this direction, right? In this case, maybe uh, try, let's type in two, right? So I'll type in two, there we go. You see that does two. Another way you could do that is to actually turn snap on, right? Like I said, you guys might not even need this, but I really wanted to explain this and get you guys to see that you have this extra little horsepower. We don't really build a lot this semester that needs this that much, but this is kind of the one instance where we, you might actually need it. Um, so snap, and you'll see there's relative and absolute, usually relative will work fine. And you can actually set your snap size preference, right? So now if I scale out, you'll see it'll snap to one unit, two units, three units, right? If I go over here and I double click on this edge loop, right? I can then go edit pivot, click on that edge, turn it off, and I can scale one, two, three. So you saw that with component kind of grabbing two edges on the sides or on the tops, around everything, we could easily kind of just use component to get this. But if you're looking for a little more precision and you want to do it to a whole edge loop, take advantage of edit pivot custom, right? 
and the fact that you can actually do snap relative sizes, right? So I'm going to do a couple steps. But remember, it doesn't even have to be snap on, right? But that is available, and that works for move, rotate, and scale, right? So if we turn rotate on, you'll notice that you have that, and it's set to degrees, 15 degrees, right? So your move, rotate, and scales have this snap function. Of course, you can technically, of course, say, hey, I want to do three for the Y, and so that makes it three. And then, like we said before, we could double click on this one, edit pivot, left click on that edge, and then we could type in three for the Y again. And then we can go over here, double click, edit pivot. That puts us in uh, edit mode, right? And of course, you can move these handles like we've done before, but you can actually, like we said, click on edges, faces, or vertices to align it. And then, of course, we could type in three. So, of course, snap will work for this, but you can also type in the numbers um, for those as well. And you see how we could easily go in here and kind of make these all fatter if we needed to? So keep in mind that if you really need to make some of these adjustments um, to the shape and size of this thing, since we don't have radial symmetry, you'll actually end up finding that component can be useful, that um, edit, pivot, edit pivot can be useful, uh, and that you can use your snap or even typing in uh, numbers for the axes to adjust or make rotations and stuff like that. So I uh, just want to make sure you guys had a good, long kind of explanation of that, showing you how the snap and the fact that you can numerically type in values here works, that you can actually um, create a custom uh, alignment for your manipulators with edit pivot, right? We've seen, we've seen that somewhat already, but we usually would just use the move handles and snap to grid or snap to vertex. But align actually is available well as well. You just click on the face, edge, or vertex you want to align it to. And then, of course, with snap and the typing of numbers, you can specifically give the, those all the same ones. But we also now know we have component, which is kind of like a local instead of a world, right? Now, in this case, um, I do kind of want this end to be a little bit rounder, so I'll go to hold down right mouse button face, and it's all still selected, which is great. I'll just do one more little extrusion, then I'll move out along the blue arrow a little bit. Um, just so it gives this a nice kind of sharper shape there. And then I'm going to go to multi-cut because I want this bottom. See how this bottom is sharper than the top? So if I hold down control, I can put an edge loop in here. Now, remember, I extruded this base out and moved it a little bit. If you don't do that, if you extrude and then extrude again, and those edge loops are on top of each other, you'll see your multi-cut won't cut through here, right? So remember, when you extrude, anytime you ever extrude any face, or border edge, or border edge loop. You should always at least move or scale it a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot, but a little bit, so that the edge loops don't end up right on top of each other in low res. See how those edge loops are not on top of each other in low res? Because um, that can cause the multi-cut to not work through there. That can cause bevel to not work through there. Um, same thing with multi-cutting, right? When you put edge loops in, make sure they're not right on top, right? Um, so I can put a little, little extra edge blender to sharpen that up. And now you see how that's looking a lot more like the picture. And of course, if I wanted that tip to be a little more rounded, we can hold down edge, right? Mouse button for edge mode. And in this case, we'll turn uh, back to world, right? World's a better default to have, right? For this move setting. And I can just go around and grab kind of these little edges on the ends here. We can always move them down just a little bit to round that end off there a bit more, right? So that'll give us a pretty good place to stop for the spokes. But that was really just multi-cuts and extruding to get a lot of the shape, and maybe some move and rotates. But you now know that you have available, if you need them, the ability to switch to component, um, the ability to use edit pivot align, and you can even type in number values and use snap um, to get kind of the same for each one. And that just gives you a little more options to get the shapes you're looking for, for something that's not supported by symmetry, right? All right, so that'd be a great place to stop this video.